Okay, good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Paolo Soria. I'm the Senior Assistant County Attorney um, here today. This is the uh, Volusia County Impact Fee Workshop um, for discussion of extraordinary circumstances as well as kind of discussing a lot of the impact fees. On my left, this is Nogan Camp. She is our consultant with Dinesh. Um, she knows everything about this. Um, I'm just kind of pretending. Um, if you haven't already, please, uh, please sign in. Um, if not, then we're going to do a short, hopefully short presentation, um, and then we'll be available to uh, answer any of your questions. Um, I think this is being recorded. Uh, the impact fee study is also available online on the county website. Um, there's an AD accessible version um, online that you can you can access instead of having to email us again. So let's let's get started. Uh, this is the uh, the starting slide, kind of the agenda. Yes, restrooms. restrooms yes, the, um, uh, as you may have noticed the restrooms close by here are under construction. So if you have to go to the restroom for any reason, they are across the rotunda by the property appraiser's office. Mm -hmm. it's just there's going to be signs. It's it's, it's a walk. Um, okay. Uh, so um, this is the agenda. Uh, we're going we're going to go through these four. Um, steps. I'm mainly going to provide you a background and purpose of impact fees. Uh, and we're mostly going to handle um, everything else. So um, after I kind of explain what impact fees are, uh, we're going to go through the uh, meat and potatoes for the technical study, going through you know justification and some of the numbers for each of these impact fees. And then we're going to um, go into uh, the legal purpose of this meeting, which is to discuss the extraordinary circumstances. Um, which we need to do if we want to raise impact fees beyond a certain percentage that was set by um, state statute uh, recently last year. Um, and then we're going to talk about, sorry, and then we're going to talk about uh, next steps and w what's going forward. So here's a little bit of background of Volusia County. Uh, we are the 12th largest county in Florida out of 67 counties. Our current population is uh, 570,400 as of the 2020 census. We are 25th in terms of population growth rate, you know, approximately 0.7 per year through uh, 2050. So we're growing. We're, we're a growing county. We're not kind of stagnating. It's a decent growth rate. Uh, 16th in terms of um, absolute population growth and predicted to uh, add 134,000 residents through 200, 250, 2050. Um, the county itself imposes three impact fees. That's uh, fire and rescue impact fees, parks and recreation impact fees, and thoroughfare road impact fees. Um, the school board imposes school uh, impact fees, but we're not gonna get into it in this discussion. That's for the school board to discuss. So um, the reason why we need the study is because the state statute requires our impact fees to be based on the um, uh, most updated and local uh, local data available. Hence, you need to justify your fee. Um, so we have we have our consultant. Um, additionally, the purpose of the study is to develop an, an EMS or emergency medical services impact fee. We currently do not impose one, um, so that's another source of revenue in order to um, provide things like um, vehicles and and buildings for our EMS services that we're providing on a countywide basis. Um, additionally, one of the purposes of the study is, is you know, whether to expand your certain parks and recreational facilities, your very large ones, um, to a county-wide level to include, you know, this also includes the coastal parks. So that's kind of the justifications of these, uh, this study. So fundamentally, everything you do with an impact fee needs to be backed by some kind of study that you are uh, meeting what's called the dual rational nexus test. Um, it's not on here, but um, essentially, so, so what is an impact fee? An impact fee is a one-time capital charge to new development. It is a non-recurring cost, so it's not a tax. It is based on the police power of local governments um, to charge a reasonable fee uh, based on the you know, expansion of well, necessary uh, services um, that are needed to accommodate new growth. Um, it covers the cost of new capacity for a capital facility that's driven by, uh, by growth. And that's kind of where we're, based, we're, we're gonna discuss this a little bit when we talk about the consumption methodology. Um, it implements the capital improvement element, the CIE and capital improvement program, the CIP of 
uh, our comprehensive plan. So that's kind of a uh, planning effort. It looks approximately five years into the future and says, okay, here are what we see are the, are the improvements, capital improvements that are necessary to support um, a potential growing population. So a portion of the impact fees are based off of that and, they, and the impact fees can be spent on those identified capital improvements. So it's, it's you know, it's, these are not just like wish lists it's they, they go into um, you know something that can make them happen. So that's that's kind of the purpose of the impact fees. Um, a little bit about dual rational nexus. You will hear that term kind of thrown around a little bit. Um, so you know what is it? So it, it's essentially it's a it's a legal test that uh, all governments must meet whenever they impose impact fees. So we have to demonstrate two things. You know the first is we have to demonstrate that there's a reasonable connection or rational nexus um, for, between the need for additional capital facilities and the growth generated by development being charged the impact fees. So you can't just pull it out of thin air. Um, you need to justify that the need actually exists. So second, and this is the second part of the dual rational nexus, is um, we have to specifically earmark the funds for use in acquiring capital facilities to benefit the development charge the impact fees. So in that, what, what that essentially means is that the impact fees cannot be used as a windfall for existing residents. It is there to, um, as, as uh, how to describe this? Um, it's there to accommodate the cost of new growth on that specific facility. So it can't be used to, um, for maintenance, it can't be used for operation, it can't be used to fix existing facilities. Um, it's, it's, it covers that particular cost as calculated of the, of the new growth. Uh, so, going. Uh, oh, next. So, um, so, why impose impact fees? Well, it maintains a, a level of service. So, for most of our infrastructure, we set a level of service of acceptable levels. Um, and the more you add development, the more it impacts those, those levels of service. So those, those payments kind of add up and allows us to do those capital improvements to maintain the level of service set in our conference of plan. Um, uh, the way that we use impact fees here uh, as a consumption uh, methodology, it does calculate you know, the, the cost of growth in terms of like quantifiable measurements. So you know, how many fire stations per 1,000 people and then you know, the, the cost of, of you know, the, uh, a house uh, based on that standard. Um, it has the ability to address large developments, so you know that usually falls into your what we call your concurrency or proportionate share. It's usually a large payment for your large developments such as DRIs. Um, that factors into the use of impact fees. So you're not they're not trickling in. You can actually get a quantifiable and, and helpful improvement. So impact fees help that. They're mostly needed when a local government is experiencing um, either very hard high growth or experiencing limited funding, or in fact both. Um, so impact fees, uh, they're kind of, they represent a, a deficit or kind of a funding gap between the cost of new infrastructure to accommodate that new development. Um, and most importantly, it's one means to address the needs of growth while not placing an ever-increasing burden upon taxpayers. So, you know, it, it grew out of this kind of fundamental notion that it, it's inequitable to impose the cost of extending uh, facilities due to new developments on existing residents, um, but at the same time, it's also that inequality goes both ways. Um, it's inequitable to put the cost um, on new development for the existing deficiencies of existing residents. So that's essentially what we have to balance while we do this effort. Uh, so we're, you know, here in Volusia County, and we're going to probably speak a little bit more. Um, intelligently about this, but we use um, a consumption-based methodology, and that's a, that's a common methodology used by many Florida, Florida jurisdictions. I think it's the majority. Um, what it does is it charges new growth based on its consumption of that capacity, um, and it kind of uh, assumes that there's some identifiable qu uh, quantity of public infrastructure and that the fee is based off of that um, identifiable uh, quantity. Um, so it's usually, I think it's based on um, the value of public infrastructure consumed per unit of land use is typically how it's generally um, described and it's based on like kind of the replacement value. So 
um, for example, um, and it sets a standard. So you have, you know, number of fire stations per thousand people that's set now. And the more you add people, the more fire stations you need. So that's kind of, it consumes that. Uh, for, for traffic, that's a little bit differently. So we, it works a little bit differently. So it uses more of a um, vehicle per lane miles traveled criteria, um, but that can, essentially it's, it's a piece of new development eats a quantifiable aspect of, of infrastructure and that's what we charge based off of. Um, it's a commonly accepted method, it's you know, stood uh, uh, legal challenges and it is, it is a way to um, calculate that dual rational nexus and meet our legal, legal requirements. Um, once again, uh, uh, it does not, it cannot be used to correct existing deficiencies, only the additional cost of new growth. Um, and county council, this is, this is set by county council, so county council can um, adopt the fees at a reduced rate uniformly across a category. Um, the numbers you're going to see in the study represent basically the theoretical maximum that the county could charge um, based on the information that we've, we've uh, been provided. Yes. So consumption-based methodology is one method. What's what's the other method? Um, Milgan can probably it's a, I think an improvement-based methodology. Yes, the other most common is the what's called needs-based. So you have a list of projects, and it solves the fee is based on uh, generating sufficient revenues to build those projects. But what happens is. If the project list is very ambitious, impact fee may be overcharging new development. If uh, there are no alternative fundings and the list is very small because there's no, not enough funding, it could be undercharging. A and the other part of it is every time that list changes, you have to change your impact fee. So it's also very, not very user friendly from so that So this is the most equitable This standard. makes sure that you are not charging them for something that's not already being provided. So this makes, the consumption base, that's the nice thing about it, just by the way it's done. If you have 20 fire stations for your population, it would generate just enough to build 20 more if the population doubles. It won't generate enough to build more than that. So it's kind of... Thank you. Yeah, also one of the additional be benefits is it's, uh, it's a bit more flexible to the local government. Um, if you do an improvement base, you're building those improvements. and. Um, if you do consumption based, you know, you can you can be a little bit more flexible in terms of how those fees are, are spent. Um, so legal requirements. So um, impact fees are kind of generated, well, historically here in Florida, they were generated by case law. Uh, but in 2006, the Florida legislature decided to codify this. Um, so this isn't, this isn't really what's called an implementing ordinance, but it does put in um, restrictions and requirements that all local governments have to meet. So um, step number one is why we're here is it must be based on the most recent and localized data. Um, some of our impact fees are using um, kind of outdated data so we need to update those. Uh, it's, it's, we're required to notice uh, for 90 days um, before they take effect. So whenever this goes before council and they approve a fee schedule, it's not into effect, not in effect until at least 90 days from that point. Uh, some of the more recent changes, uh, we, we cannot be collected prior to a building permit. So when you file your building permit, you're going to know what your impact fees are, um, and that is the, you know, the minimum point where we could collect. We don't collect at that point. I think we collect that, currently we collect that certificate of occupancy but that is a, um, a determination for, for a council to make, but we can't go before building permit. Um, uh, once again, it needs to be based on the rational nexus, the amount of collection and expenditure, so the legislature has adopted that, that legal test into the statute itself. Um, this goes back to, you know, you can't use it to pay for existing um, uh, deficiencies or deficits, um, except when there's a nexus showing use for the need for due to new growth. That's mainly due with uh, using impact fees to pay for bond for for bonds, you can kind of do that. It's kind of the only exception for that. Um, if we are challenged on the fee, this is important. Uh, we have the burden of proof. Uh, normally, when you do these types of legislations, um, you know you defer to the local government for their decision-making authority. But you know the, the 
legislature has said no uh, judge when you're looking at the, uh, the justification of the fee um, local government you don't get the benefit of the doubt so automatically we're kind of on a back foot so that's why everything that we do needs to be justified by a study or some um, some rational nexus or some, uh, something that's you know reasonable and rational uh, and we also need to account for the impact fee collections and expenditures. That's the, the second prong of dual rational nexus. Make sure we're earmarking it properly, we're making sure that we are accounting for it, for it properly, and we're not double charging or taxing beyond our, our legal limits. So more uh, legal requirements. Um, the fee schedule is now tied to the date of the permit submission. Um, previously here in the county, we tied it to when the fees were due. We can't do that anymore. Now, if you submit your building permit, you know, assuming your building permit doesn't get canceled or revoked or you never use it, that's, that kind of sets the fee you're going to pay. Um, one of the things is uh, impact fee credits must be provided on a dollar for dollar basis for um, c contributions or exactions. So if, uh, if a developer or someone provides a right of way, we are required to credit that against the future payment of impact fees on a dollar for dollar basis. Uh, sir, you had, a, you had your hand raised up. Uh, can you give some examples of uh, how the, uh... excuse me, can you give some examples of uh, how the credits are calculated and put into use? Uh, well, can we, can we uh, answer that later? That's sure. that's whole part of Milgan's uh, Discussion. These credits are actually different than the credits in right. the impact fee formula. These are what's called developer credits. So if a development makes an improvement, say for example, improves an intersection or donates land, the value of that is set aside and the, as they pull permits or sealed, right. uh, it pays for the impact fees, that dollar okay. amount. Yeah, this is, this is a direct dollar for dollar that happens after the calculation. Um, other than you know the ones that where you calculate a future value based on you know other sources of revenue, so, so we'll differentiate those. Uh, one of the other things is now credits, um, developer credits, we'll call them that from now on, are transferable from one impact fee zone, um, well within an impact fee zone, and if they uh, they are also transferable to an adjacent impact fee zone, if you can demonstrate that that development also benefits. So. Uh, you know, if you are the holder of impact fee developer credits, they're a little bit more flexible now uh, in terms of being able to transfer and kind of sell them on the market. Uh, so, and this is uh, credits must provide the same benefit of intensity or density that's usually tied to the credits also index along with your fee schedule. Um, here, I think our proposals, we're just going to tie the credits to the data creation. So your fee schedule is your fee schedule, it's not going to change. Um, some additional more recent uh, legislative changes. Uh, so um, this one allows local governments to uh, waive all impact fees for projects defined as affordable. So if you are doing an affordable um, project and you, know, you meet that statutory criteria, um, the county may, it does not have to, it can waive the impact fees. Um, and normally, uh, you would have to subsidize those credits from some other source, but here the legislature is plainly saying, no, you, you can just waive them and you don't have to make the impact fee whole. So that's kind of a, a new thing that's been introduced to um, the impact fee you know, body of law. Um, and the required indexing, I kind of touched upon that earlier. Uh, this is the most recent changes, so this is kind of why we are here. There is a, a limit on the amount an impact fee can increase by the local governments per year. So we can't raise an impact fee more than 12.5% per year, um, and uh, unless we do, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, uh, no impact fee can be increased more than 50%, you know, even if you do it per, uh, per year. Um, and it can't be increased more than once every four years. So you set your impact fee, and that's that's it for four years. Uh, yes, sir. This is one thing. Uh, the limit, that was done within the last four years, is that correct? The limit was done in 2021. Four years? Yes. And, um, and so uh, that, uh, the history of who passed that limit, do you have any information on that and how that was done? You mean which jurisdictions exceeded the 50%? Well, yeah, which group that the legislators passed and then on impact fees? Um, I, 
uh, forget which bill, which uh, three, I forget which 337 was, but there's usually, if you check the bill, um, there's a sponsor. Um, I don't recall who the sponsor was for this one. But they're always 2021. 2021. So House Bill, House Bill 337. That's yes. So, um, so it cannot be increased more than once every four years. Um, but there is an exception, which is why we're here. So if you know we conduct a study, you know that's good for the immediately immediate past 12, past 12 years, demonstrating extraordinary circumstances. We're holding you know two public workshops, so you're in workshop two of two, um, and it's approved by two thirds of the governing body. You can exceed any one of those limits. So we can go above 50%, we can go above 12.5% per year, we can amend it more than once every four years. And the, and the study, you said that we had some studies, uh, I, I believe that this time is the one in, in the 90s, is that correct? Uh, no, the study is going to be an extraordinary circumstances right. study. But they, they did an impact fee then in, in the 90s in the Volusia County, there was mm -hmm. a big push for impact fees that happened, and so they brought in a lot of money to has it ever been looked at how much money was brought into this county at that time? Um, well, those you know, are those are kind of this is background, so I just yeah. I don't know the answer to oh, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I was there. yes. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but essentially, that's that's why we're here. So if if. We've, we've set up the groundwork. We've got, you know, Neil Gunn will go over the extraordinary circumstances um, for that. So this is the, the public meeting. So if um, the council wants to exceed any one of those, they can, but they must do so by a two-thirds vote. Um, would, and then, this, would this PowerPoint be available to the public? Yes, we well, can. Do we email it or is it available? send it to anyone who would like it. They'll send it in uh, emails to Okay, that's impact fees at volusia.org. The PowerPoint. The PowerPoint, yes. So, and I'll hand it over. Yes, sir. Uh, just to be quick, uh, will you be um, uh, defining extraordinary circumstances in this presentation? Well, it's not defined in the statute, so we're going to have to describe what the extraordinary circumstances are. Right. <laughs> it just says extraordinary circumstances. Good evening. I'll, I'll start the technical portion. Uh, so the oh, I'm sorry. So the basic impact fee formula looks at cost of adding capacity. So that's really the value of the capital facilities, and from that we subtract any non-impact fee revenues that are being generated by new development that will be used toward this infrastructure. So to the extent that county is using taxes, a portion will come from future development, and we give a credit for that, this is the other credit, um, to make sure that we are not charging new development once through the impact fee and once through the tax. So that net cost gets multiplied by demand and it's uh, me measured in terms of travel for transportation and population for the other fees. So before we go into all the details, we just want to show you the summary of calculated, these are full calculated fees. So for a single family home of mid-size 2,000 square foot, the total fee would be about 7,200. Currently it's at 6,300. So it's about eight, $800, $900 uh, difference. And then we have some example land uses, uh, like the light industrial office, retail. Uh, you can see how they are changing as well. Um, and those are all per 1,000 square foot. And the full fee schedule has about 40 or so land uses. This is, uh, shows the same type of information with the House Bill 337 cap applied to it. So if, once the, we apply the cap, then the calculated fees are limited at 6,800 instead of that 7,200. So it's, it goes from 6,300 to 6,800 about for a mid-size home. Uh, in the technical study, we'll go through several components, uh, and I'll go through it first one more detail but then you'll see a pattern repeating and we basically look at the, in each one the inventory of the capital facilities the value level of service the cost of these facilities again any non-impact fee contributions in terms of credit and then the cal calculate the net cost and the fee and provide a fee comparison so if we start with fire rescue 
uh, the, there are 20 county-owned stations with about 93,000 square feet in the inventory, about 40 acres of land. Uh, the unit costs, when we looked at the unit costs for each of the service areas, we looked at what the county built recently, if there are any bids for, or estimates for upcoming construction. Uh, we looked at the insurance values of the existing buildings, and then we supplemented that data with the data from other Florida jurisdictions for the similar type facilities. On the land side, again, similarly, we reviewed any recent purchases, uh, if there's any appraisals, and then we supplemented that with vacant land uh, sales throughout the county based on data obtained from property appraisers um, you know, database. So those were, the, in each case, sort of the process we went through. So in the case of fire rescue, the land was estimated at 60000 per acre, and the building's about $400 per square foot. In addition, we, the inventory also includes vehicles and equipment. In total, they add up to be about $19 million. For uh, impact fee purposes, we measure the level of service as stations per population. And it, it, typically, fire departments uh, use a response time level of service, but that's more operational. So for impact fee purposes, again, we look at um, how many stations per population or what, what one station, how many people is handled by one station. And here it's more about 6,000, 55 to 5,500 to 6,000 per station. So that kind of shows our beginning point. So uh, in terms of the total Asset value, it, it, buildings, land, vehicles, and equipment, they all add up to about almost 60 million. That divided by population gives us about $515 per person. And what that represents is that up to this point, the community invested at a level of $500 per person into fire infrastructure. So that's our starting point to charge the new development. We can't pick any, any higher number than that. We then look at other revenue sources being used for this infrastructure and the county is using certain ad valorem funding and again a portion will come from future development. Because it's ad valorem we also make an adjustment to recognize that new homes tend to pay higher ad valorem taxes because they don't have the Save Our Homes benefit yet. So we adjust that increase that by about 50 percent. So then on a per resident basis that results in about eight dollar per year and then over a 20, uh, over a 25 year period, like the life of the building, that results in $145 for residential land uses and about $95 for non-residential land uses. So then the net cost is basically taking the total cost and subtracting the credit. So that gives us the $370 per person for residential land uses and about $420 for non-residential land uses. So these costs get multiplied by the residents per unit uh, for each type of land use. So here we have a couple examples of residential and couple, some examples of non-residential. So a mid-sized 2,000 square foot home would pay about almost $600 at, with the full calculated rate. The current adopted rate is about 300, and the cap rate by the house bill would be about 440. So you kind of see the other land uses as well. Again, these are just some example land uses. Um, so this chart compares the Volusia County's figures to other counties. So here we try to show the study date. So you can have a sense how old their data is. You know, for example, Brevard County hasn't updated since 2000 and so on. And then also the assessed portion. And that's that policy decision if their board decided to adopt it at a lower percentage. You know, that's indicated. Um, we have two of these slides. So in this slide, again, single family 2,000 square foot home ranges anywhere from $55 to $740. And then the second set of ca uh, counties, in their case, is about anywhere from 250 to 6, 650 or so. So that's kind of the range of the fees. We also review the benefit zones. So the purpose of benefit zones is to make sure that the, the uh, projects are built within close proximity of the fee payer 
and that you know, fee payer benefits from the investment. They are most common with transportation because it's difficult to show um, like if a payer in the northern part of the county how they would benefit from a roadway all the way in the southern other end of the county. But in the case of fire rescue, typically if there's a single benefit district because all the stations help each other. They send, they respond to uh, incidents from their other stations area. They send the vehicles and so on. So in their case, uh, what's really typical is the entire service area, unless there's a significant barrier or something like that. So that's the change from going from four districts to a single district. Emergency medical services, that's the new fee. Um, it has about, inventory includes about 30,000 square foot of building space and about three acres of land, as well as the vehicles and equipment. The land is estimated at about 60,000 per acre and buildings at about $300 per square foot for stations and about 100 for the sport uh, buildings. Well, is currently in EMS no, this, this would be a new fee if adopted, yeah. So again, level of service, these stations are handling about almost 200,000 uh, people and it's a county-wide service. So the total asset value is almost 30 million and that divided by the population gives us about $50 per person and again that's the investment made into EMS infrastructure up to this point on a per person basis. There is a credit to reflect the EMS fund expenditures toward the capital. So then the net cost ends up being about $45 per person and that multiplied by the residence per unit gives us the fee schedule and again it's about $70 for a 2,000 square foot home um, and this chart shows the comparison and here you can see the other jurisdictions and again how old their studies are, what the adoption percentages, but the, their fees range from about $40 to $140 for EMS only. Parks and Recreation so parks and recreation includes uh, local parks, district, and coastal parks. And the standard uh, level of service is measured in terms of acres per thousand residents. So current achieved level of service of the parks that are owned by the county is about 3.7 acres per thousand residents. The county's adopted standard is about seven acres. So what the achieved level of service shows is what, what's been invested up to this point, whereas the standard tells us the intended level of service going forward. And we typically use the lower of the two because if we haven't achieved it, we can't charge the new development at a higher rate. And then if it was other way around, we had a higher achieved level of service, but we weren't intending to continue, then we wouldn't charge them that either. So we picked the lower of the two and here, we use the achieved level of service for that reason. And again, uh, we go through the land value calculated for each type of park and divide by uh, service area population. So that gives us a land value per resident of $60 for local parks and about $270 for regional and coastal parks. Similarly, recreational facility values uh, results in about $170 per resident of, for local parks and about uh, 80 for district and coastal together. So the full cost for uh, local parks is about $230 per person and then the district and coastal parks is about $350. And again, this is the, just the capital asset value if they were to build it today or purchase it today. Uh, and parks had some grants and other funds being used for capacity projects, so that generates a credit. And district parks also had beach access fee, general fund, and grants used uh, for them, so that's, and the coastal parks. So again, that, there's a credit because of that. So then net impact cost is the difference between the cost and credits. So it's about $185 for local parks and about $315 for 
regional and coastal parks. Parks in Pakis are charged only to residential land uses, so uh, this, this shows you the full fee schedule in that sense, and we, for, this is for local parks. So we take the residence per unit by size of home and multiply by that net cost to come up with the fully calculated rate. And you can see, again, the current adopted rate is 245. It, it does not have tiering. This time, the county wanted to tier so that we have a more equitable schedule. And also, we recognized that there are fewer people in the smaller homes. Um, if we were to cap that, the first two tiers, the calculated fee is less than 50%, so that would be, that would not trigger a per se a cap, and then as of 1700 or so, it would be capped at 367. This is the same type of, uh, basically, analysis for the district and coastal parks. So the fee would range from 525 to 740, depending on the home size. Current fee is about 350, so with the House Bill 337, it will be kept at 525. So this chart and one more is showing comparisons. So total, um, both local district coastal adopted fee is about almost 600. Uh, this would go up to 1200 for a 2000 square foot home if it was adopted at 100%. When we look at other counties, so this set of counties range from 300 to 3,600. And then the next set ranges from almost 220 to about 2,300 per uh, home. Just like the fires, we reviewed the benefit zones, and there are currently four benefit zones, and they were mostly maintained. Uh, there were some small adjustments to reflect better the municipal boundaries, interlocal agreements, and growth patterns. So this is the existing four zones. And it's basically the, the regional and coastal is a single countywide, both currently, and it will stay that way. And then the local parks will continue to have four districts with the, some adju minor adjustments to the boundaries. Transportation, that's calculated a little bit different, so I'm going to show you the formula. So we start with the cost of a roadway, so it costs about 3.3 miles to build one lane mile. So basically, if it's a one mile of roadway with two lanes, it's like 6.6 .6 million. That carries a capacity of 10,000 cars. So then the cost per vehicle miles of capacity is about $330. So what that says, every time a car is added to the roadway system, for them to travel a mile costs $330 for that infrastructure. Average home generates about 21 vehicle miles of travel. So those two multiplied gives us the total impact cost per home of 6,900. And then we subtract the credit again, any other revenue sources, so that's 1400 in this case. The net fee would be about 5500 So just to give you a sense how that formula works. So uh, the man component for transportation looks at the number of trips generated by each land use, how many trips per day, how long those trips were in terms of their travel in miles, and then how much of it was new trips. So if someone was going from home to office and stop on the way at a gas station, we don't charge that gas station for that trip because they were already going somewhere. It wasn't made for the gas station kind of thing. So that's that percent new trips. So the data sources is uh, for the, especially the trip generation is the Institute of Transportation Engineers Handbook. That's the 11th edition. Uh, we have data from Florida, throughout Florida, that's our actual studies at uh, sites, different sites, so that gives us all three components. We also uh, validate that with the regional planning model, travel model. Cost component, just like the other areas, looks at any recent projects in Volusia County, any bids, so those averaged about 2.7 million per lane mile. This was like projects between 2014 and 2020. We also look at uh, other Florida jurisdictions, what they are averaging, and they were averaging about 2.8, so we use the local cost 
And this is kind of showing it uh, construction costs change over time, going back to 97. And you can see uh, 2005, 2006, we had that big boom, and then we had the Great Recession, the costs started coming down. Now they are going back up again. So in addition to construction costs, we have costs related to purchase of right-of-way, design, and then construction and engineering inspections. And so all together, they average about 3.3 million per lane mile. On the credit side, um, we have state funding. We recognize credit for their contributions. County is also using some gas tax. Um, and there's some debt service also being paid with gas tax. So annually that generates about $30 million of other revenue source contribution and about 60% of it is from the state, 18 million out of 30, and then the rest is county revenues. So one um, issue with the roads is that, you know, we get this question, they have the fuel tax, why are we having such challenges? As you know, the fuel taxes are on a per gallon basis, and state pennies are indexed, but local pennies are not allowed to be indexed. And then all the other revenue sources, since they are a percentage of a dollar amount, they are indexed. So, so fuel taxes are one of the most inefficient revenue sources, and over time, between the fuel efficiency and the inflation inability to index, they are losing their value. So a penny in mid-90s is now maybe worth half of its value. So then you have a revenue source that's losing the value while the costs are increasing. So that gap, the funding gap, keeps growing. So overall, the calculated fee ends up being about 50, 54, 64, almost 5,500 for single family mid-size home. And the current fee um, is pretty close to that, it's 5,400, so it, it almost, very few of the land uses in the transportation fee schedule is increasing more than 50%. And this is also one of the more recently updated fees. So for the most part, it's not triggering the capping, as you can see. Like the capped fee is the same as the fully calculated fee. So this chart, Maybe? yes. Uh, I noticed that uh, you had the single and the multifamily. Uh, what was the condo? What kind of they, they go under multifamily. Okay. And multifamily has two tiers, low, right, right. low rise, and okay. we just show the and low two rise tiers here. Of multifamily. Correct. Okay. Um, so this is showing the comparison to other jurisdictions. Again, we have two of these. So here, uh, single family, again, mid size ranges anywhere from, it seems like 15, uh, 1,500 to 15,000 or 16,000 um, in the rural area of Osceola County. And then this set, the range is anywhere from 1,800 to again 12,000 or so. This benefit zones are the same ones as the same boundaries as the parks, so it has the same changes. Again, just some alignments to better reflect the development patterns as well as the municipal boundaries, so we are not breaking it, cities in the middle or so. So this brings us back to the summary that you saw earlier. Again, in total, uh, again, for a mid-sized single-family home, the f at the full calculated rate, the fees would go up from 6,300 to 7,200. With the cap, it would be about 6,300 to 6,800. Okay, so the extraordinary circumstances, there is no definition of the extraordinary circumstances in the legislation. So, so far, the counties that use that to adopt fees that are increasing more than 50% were the higher growth counties uh, or they haven't updated their fees very long time. More rural counties or, or really low growth counties, they did not necessarily use that clause. But um, so in the case of Volusia County, again, you are a large county and continuing to grow, a growing county. Um, the permitting has been increasing, so there's a lot of activity which is putting pressure. Uh, this is kind of sh showing the projections. There, the travel is expected to increase about 44% by 2045, but the lane miles added, like built, is only about 10%. So that's, again, it indicates in 
growth and increasing congestion. The current fire and parks impact fees were based on a 2001 study, so they are 20 years old, and those are the ones that we are seeing bigger increases. As we went through it, in the case of roads, the increases are not really hitting 50% for almost all of the land uses. There are very few, and that's due to demand changes. And that's a more recently updated study. So, in terms of uh, needs, each department ha has, you know, more than enough needs for impact fee uh, funding. So, fire rescue at their full calculated rate, they would generate from 250 to maybe 315,000 per year. And they have uh, several station expansions that they need, as well as um, uh, training center additions. So these expansions are costing anywhere from 100,000 to 350,000. So they'll, you know, they can do some of these with the impact fees. Emergency medical services are likely to generate 210 to 300,000 per year, and. Um, and those can be used for additional ambulances, expansion of the stations, uh, new stations, and so on. Parks, the local parks will probably generate about 150 to 180,000, whereas um, the district and coastal parks are more like 200 to 250 range. And again, they have a long list of projects, um, in building of pickleball courts, ball fields, you know, new other improvements throughout multiple parks, ex um, playgrounds, etc. So, and the transportation is likely to generate about 12 to 15 million per year. And the, it, again, the examples are the lane additions, intersection improvements, new road constructions, new traffic signals, and so on. So the next steps is, again, we are here today to answer any questions and then September 20th is the adoption hearing. Is that right? uh, well, we'll, we'll aim for that. <laughs> um, we'll see if we can make it. But that's, uh, that's our proposal, you know, to have it adopt there. But um, depending upon the feedback we'll get, um, you know, it could, it could change. Um, It's right next to him. Sir, can you do your microphone? Thank you. It's on, I think. Hello. Okay. So I've long, I've long wanted a, a impact fee on fire services, but I always thought it was going to be a public safety impact fee. Is there any reason the police were left out? The police? Um, by choice, we don't have a, a law enforcement impact fee. Um, so no, not law enforcement, public safety. Public impact. safety. Um, well, that's fire rescue, right? And then you've got EMS is the additional impact fee, what we are proposing, emergency medical service. Um, so that's, those are the, you know, really concrete things that you can charge for. Because remember, you're, you're just charging for um, infrastructure and capacity. So, you know, your vehicles, your stations, your equipment that, that are longer than, last well, longer long than five overdue. years. Yes. Long overdue, I understand. And I'm great to see the fire service is doing that. It should have been done. But you know, well, it was a great boom in our county and it's been development. With it. But I just wondered why it was not a public safety impact. So it's a better sell. But is there any reason that you said, you said law enforcement? Uh, well, it's it's usually you want to be very clear about the type of impact fee you are charging. Okay. Okay. Remember that whole dual rational nexus thing. You don't want to be too hazy. So you know you, you definitely want to identify the public infrastructure that you currently have and the amount you know that is being consumed by the new development of that that infrastructure. So the better concrete, the more concrete you are about what is being consumed, the more defensible your impact fees can be. Well, public safety would also include the beach, beach patrol, the beach services, beach policing services. That would be public safety as well. Uh, okay. 
Yes, but that would fall more into like a law enforcement so type have, thing. Yeah, I just had one other question. So this is the four that you, you proposing, but there's no input for any kind of, for example, a, a one more impact fee, a different kind. For example, water quality impact fee. There's no proposal at this time for that. Is that correct? Um, well, it depends upon how you would characterize the water quality impact fee. I mean, that would require an entirely new study. Um, you can do a, a sewer fee or usually when you have, like, I'm not sure what you mean water quality, like the, like, you know, what infrastructure goes with water quality. I mean, yeah. we do mitigation in terms of that, but it's, we're talking about things that, the infrastructure that requires to be built. There's more clean water, that's what water quality is. Um, well, we have water. We have lots of it. It's all over. Uh, you can. I mean, I mean, we, you have your utility connection fees for utilities. Yeah. So you know, depending right. upon if they plan it into their capital program to have a, um, a reclaimed water facility or something like that, then potentially those unit connection fees can be increased um, and charged to new development to pay for that additional infrastructure. Right. Um, that's that's an entirely different conversation. Um, than this. Sorry. John, you want to clarify something? <laughs> yes, I just wanted to clarify that another reason why we just have the two separate fees, the fire service, that's only charged to the unincorporated area, whereas EMS is countywide, and that's charged in the cities included. You can be with the city now. Correct. As it relates to stormwater, we the county does have the stormwater fee. It's Alameda, Delta is going all the way to Slider Beach for transport sometimes. Any any Anybody further else? questions? I got a number of them. None of them related to fire, so <laughs> <laughs> have your way. <laughs> um, first off, my name is Evan. I'm not only a resident of the commissioner's uh, district, but I am also a, uh, I also work for developers. So I get to both ends of this. The, uh, so I have a number of questions here. I'll try to be brief. The, uh, obviously when you're increasing your, your fee is on a development level, that's just shifted down to the consumer. So when you're increasing your impact fees, that's just shoved down to the consumer, which increases your housing fees for uh, single family, mobile homes, whatever the case may be. Less for commercial, but more so for, for residential. So uh, that's obviously a concern as we're looking at an affordability crisis with the housing market. Is that something that's taken into account when you were deciding on the increasing of your fees? Um. Well, that's, that goes into the calculation, the, that's what, and the different tiers and sizes of houses. So yep. it used to be in the county, we only have one housing type, and that's it. So now I think we have seven? We have five. Five, five housing types. Um, so you take that one housing and then you split it um, over multiple housing sizes, um, and then your, that fee goes down for your smaller housing, and then up higher for your higher housing on the assumption you know, more people, more more impact. Um, additionally, we did mention, and it's uh, up to council whether or not they want to use that statutory out. Um, so, if your development is affordable, then um, they can direct us to draft up a, a, a waiver for those housing that is affordable. And that the legislature said, okay, those types of houses don't have to pay impact fees. Well, that's a separate question. Uh, it's a separate issue. <laughs> You know, a lot of people don't understand affordable housing, so putting a cap on what you can uh, charge for a home is separate from your normal housing costs. So that was just curious about normal housing, which you've answered that I, I think effectively. Um, as far as the section that you spoke about with proportionate fair share, uh, land dedications and capacity construction, with lessing out the proportionate share and focusing generally on land dedication and capacity construction, for those that you can put a fixed value on uh, that a uh, commercial landowner would be 
uh, donating over, say for instance, the land. Let's stick with that. That's the easiest one. You're building a gas station, your impact fees are $300,000. And your land that you're donating for, I don't know, let's say two left turn lanes at the corner of, of Woodland and 17, or 17 and Woodland, Woodland and 92, uh, are gonna have a high value. Probably the value of that property is gonna be possibly, if not the same, higher than that $300,000 credit. Um, will there be a cap on that credit, or would the additional funds be available for future developments of a more intense use? Um, what do you mean available? Uh, a cap? But there's no, there's, I mean, the statute requires, and John, you can probably speak, but you know, if you are making a dedication or a prop share, it requires a dollar for dollar credit towards future payment of impact fees um, based on the, uh, the value of the land when it was created. <laughs> the only thing I was going to add is typically if we're getting land from a developer, mm -hmm. we typically work with the developer. They may hire their own appraiser. We may have ours and we'll negotiate what that is. Typically we're looking at corner trips and stuff like that. If someone's building or donating land for a turn lane, yeah. it's typically the logical nexus. They need that turn lane for their development. That's site related. So we would not, you know, unless it was building a left turn lane and adding capacity on the county thoroughfare road network, we would not give impact the credits for site related projects. Okay, okay, fair enough, thank you. Um, there's a minor one for you. Uh, the housing market currently cooling. The uh, extreme inflation, has that been, over the next five years, has that decreasing growth been taking So 2045 is we were just showing projections mm -hmm. as far as the growth rates and so on. So it's it's that comes from the University of Florida Bureau of Business and Economic Research. So that's their projections looking at that. Um, but as far as impact fee purposes, really the calculations are what's been up to this point invested, and then you know what what will be the next increment of construction. Okay. Uh, also, to I got ahead of myself there. Fees, after they're voted upon and approved, uh, they're enacted 90 days after the approval. Is that correct? Minimum 90 days. Minimum 90 days. That's your intention, though, is 90 days. Y yes. So, um, if we actually get it on the September 20th, then it wouldn't be effective, I think, until January 2nd, 2023. So, you know, if that date gets pushed to November or December or even next year, um, you know, it's, it, it would be 90 days from that point. Okay. Um, for the EMS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's a simple question. Oh. On your slide that you had, you went through it kind of quickly, but on your slide for multifamily being less than single family for impact fees, it seemed like I just wanted some rationale for everybody on that one. I mean, as a, as a planner, I kind of get it, but um, but it does seem like a higher rate of service would be taking place in a multifamily building, but it, it showed less. So this is for the capital facilities, not for operational. Okay. So, th so what we are looking at is, um, you know, they, what, how many vehicles they make, they are likely to add, you know, they, or the buildings that they're gonna build. So that's really tied to density of people at each location. So depending on your needs and the population density, you may have to buy another ambulance, you may have to build another station. That's different than operational, that, that one land use may be calling you a lot. That, that's not, you know, that's for the operational budget. Yep. So that's why, and Persons per housing units for multifamily is fewer than single family. That's why. Understood. I just want to clarify. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I'm almost done, I swear. Um, I noticed very briefly, too, on your slides, uh, and this, I think this was under their Parks and Rec for uh, mobile home. Lucia County has a lot of mobile homes. The uh, and I was kind of curious, it looked like the fee was doubling, it, or the 
proposed fees were doubling, which I thought was kind of odd that it was so high for mobile homes. No, so so your fee, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, you, you all don't have a separation of single family, multifamily, mobile home in, uh, Volusia County doesn't have that separation. It just has the sizes. I but thought you had other slide. jurisdictions do. So what we did is for Volusia County, we used uh, a 1,300 okay. square foot home, assuming mm -hmm. mobile home is that big. You see what I mean? So you, the, really the full fee schedule, so if the mobile home is 1,200 and under, it's going to be the lowest rate, depending on okay. its size. Okay, yeah, I got lost in there. Okay. Uh, no, I know. It's not, yeah. not everybody's schedule is the same, <laughs> so then you, you're trying to make them somewhat comparable. And for transportation, you had mentioned pass-by trips. This is probably one of my biggest heartburns. What other studies are accepted outside of ITE? There are limited studies. What, what else is accepted for impact fees? Uh, to Within the county ordinance, we use the generalized national standards. Every developer has the right to do an independent study and verify the basically yeah. the three different um, values or um, sites. sites so that they can do it basically their own study. It's just TIA then, yeah. It's more than a TIA, it's more like a trip generation study. And, and we can talk afterwards. Yeah, I'd like to talk afterwards about that one. That was a hot topic I wanted to have answered it, so. I think in the 23 plus years I've been here, I can count the number of independent studies on maybe one hand. I believe you. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think the early, um, I think maybe not early 90s and so on, there were more studies until the fee schedules got settled better uh, because it used to be few land uses and everybody was combined. So then you had, hey, I'm not that much, you know, I don't have that much traffic. But now I think it's pretty settled that we don't see that many alternative studies across the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, last question. Um, you're addressing extraordinary circumstances because you're going over 50% over the next four years? The fire and um, parks, because they haven't been updated for 20 years, their increases are significantly more than 50%. Yeah. So to really have a fee that is useful and generates some revenue, I, you know, they may need to be adjusted. So I think county wants to have that option available to the council. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Um, everything is, is hopefully will be online. Um, if we meet that September 20th date, it'll be uh, fully advertised and you know, you'll hear about it. Um, if not, then kind of stay tuned on when we can actually um, have that final ordinance and um, you know, essentially what form it'll take. Because right now, this is a lot of options to give to council um, and we don't know what the public feedback is going to be yet. <laughs>